everybody. Welcome back to an exciting episode of a fan zone debate. We're here for what is sure to be an exciting one. We got Robert Kastner going up against Mr. VHS Nazario Montenegro. Uh, Nazario has challenged for the belt here at fan zone before, but it's been a while since he's been in the title contention on the other side of things. We got Robert Kastner, like I said, Robert having a uh, pretty good showing in the tournament, going out in round number two against former champion uh, Jacoby. Uh, but Robert also played in a number one contender match uh, last year against Cody. So uh, Robert um, has gotten pretty far in this league. Going to see what he can do tonight against Nazario. I'm looking forward to it. Mark, you are here and you're not Brian Michaels. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. I guess, you know, okay too, since, you know, I'm not Brian Michaels. I mean, you got you to ask him how his life is. I don't know. You know, I like seeing Robert play. Uh, he, I think he has a very, uh, very uh, interesting and kind of straightforward uh, approach to it. And as for Nazario, I think he's just happy I'm not running this match. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to move over to Cody. Cody, welcome to the match. Uh, how are you doing, my friend? And uh, what do you think about Robert versus Nazario? I mean, fireworks were going off before we hit live, so this should be a blast. Uh, Nazario has been one of my longest like friends in this community, uh, so, and I've always wanted to play him in debate. He's always, in his opinion, fucked by the judges. Um, so he's never been able to get there. I played Robert. Robert was really strong. I don't remember how that score ended up, but again, I in my head it was a lot more intense, if not, because I know I don't know if we got to a bonus question or not. But he is he's a fierce uh person in all aspects of trivia. In general and geek and fan zone, he's good enough. So this should be exciting. I don't I really don't have I think it's a 51-49 like, split between them. I don't know who's going to win. I don't know what the questions or the answers are. I'm excited to see what happens. But, yeah, I could definitely see one of these guys being the people, one of them that challenged me at the end. So Yeah? Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, we'll bring in the lower-ranked player, uh, Mr. VHS. Nazario, welcome. You're not laying in bed tonight. You're in somebody's closet. Um, how are you doing, my friend? And uh, welcome my back. My closet with the toys. Yes the the toys that are appropriate um how are you doing nazario so fucking tired man like i got uh it's not a new job i'm working for the same company but like they assigned me a new project and it's like well enough desk work for you boy go in the sun from 7 a.m to 7 p.m every day get some mud on your shoes and move some dirt and and i'm dying this may be the least prep I have done for a debate in like a year. So I'm just going to follow my gut and see where it takes me. That's a, that's a good, that's a good strategy. That's the, that's, the, that's, a, that's what we call the timber collar strategy. I feel you. Uh, Nazario. I can't wait to see what happens. Let's bring in Robert. Robert, welcome back. Uh, you're the higher ranked player here tonight. Like I said, <laughs> uh, you lost against Jacoby in your last match. So someone if you, that you had to go out against, a good person to go out against uh and now you're going up against nazario your thoughts yeah uh so cody we we ended three to one but the hallmark for that for me was i got tim to vote against uh monsters inc i bring that up all the time because that's the shining achievement that still my... pisses me off to yeah. that you're right that's yeah right. the shining the shining achievement of my debate career um obviously this is a weird clash of styles um i don't care how i don't care if nazari had been working 96 hours straight in the sun i i know what sort of expectation of wave of energy to get and um not to bring the mood down but you know i was just privy and i know we don't like to like know like hold a newspaper up so we know the date of when these are recorded but i just wanted to bring up i i wanted to say um you know rest in peace to garth uh mm -hmm. that was just a recent thing that happened and uh I just found out about it like an hour before and it, it's still kind of affecting me. Um, so I just wanted to bring it up because, you know, he was sort of emblematic of what a community, what this community is. And yeah. he's the nicest guy. He made everybody feel better. And I just wanted to make sure that we were aware of that and the community knew that. Um, so, yeah, yeah, this actually, this airs um, not this upcoming Monday, but the following uh, the four, it's actually Labor Day, this, this, uh, this air. So in a, in about a week and a half. So I was thinking about whether or not I wanted to say something like that, but I figured it since it aired afterwards, but Robert, thank you for throwing yeah. that out there because I think that that is a, a really nice thing to say. And 
and I, I think we all feel uh, very similar. Um, and uh, Garth never played in debate, but uh, played in fandom, played in melee, and uh, was always in the. I, my, my favorite like moments Back are the chats. Yeah, the chats, especially uh, when we were doing the multiplex loves movies watch alongs. Uh, he was watching along with all those. So that, that was always a lot of fun. So um, thank you for saying that, Robert. Um, and with that, we are going to move on to the match. And here's how it's going to work. So um, there are going to be four uh, prep debate questions uh, based off of categories that the players drafted. We are going to uh, hear them debate it tonight before our very souls. So they are going to get one minute to open five minute free form, followed by a one minute <clears throat> closing at the end of uh the debate uh mark Cody <coughs> and i will write on our handy dandy boards who we thought won the debate two out of three votes wins you a point and the first person to three points wins the match um we will go to a bonus question if we are tied two to two should we get there so uh any questions from the players no Okay, then we will get to it. All right. Uh, I love that movie, man. I do too, dude. It's so fucking good. All right. Uh, so we are going to kick it off. With the first question, uh, this was drafted by Robert. It is in the category of directors. Uh, the question is, what real-life person should Adam McKay make a film about next? Uh, so, Robert, you are going to kick this one off. You have one minute to open your argument when you start talking, and I will come in to give the 10-second warning when the time comes. So I think given Adam McKay's pickiness with regards to how he selects projects and how his interests have shift from these sort of larger than life comedies to these hyperbolic non-fictional recounts of American history, I couldn't think of a better subject for this, uh, for time and consideration for a feature than Benjamin Franklin. Um, he likes to ensure McKay does that the audience uh, sees in a point in time, delves into serious material, uh, but he can do so in a way that sort of exposes hypocrisy and controversy. And you're intended to laugh at that, how messed up that person's involvement was in the whole thing. Uh, and uh, if there's a hint of scandal underneath it, that's great. And Franklin has all that in droves. Uh, he's a political figure. He's an inventor. He had a lot of influence. He was kind of one of the first wealthy Americans. And McKay likes to drag down the, the wealthy in America, uh, as we've seen with like the other guys and with Vice and everything. So I think uh, giving Benjamin Franklin an opportunity to have a shining option would be the best choice for McKay. Time. Okay. Uh, we're going to move over to Nazario. Nazario, you have one minute to open your argument when you start talking. I also think that he enjoys doing like the political angles nowadays. And he proved with Vice that he's interested in, in character studies of recent political figures. And I don't think there's a more interesting study you can do than Donald J. Trump. Uh, that is a man that seems to have been accidentally elected president. Uh, I don't think anybody in 2016 actually believed for like a real moment that there was a possibility that he would win. Even he seemed surprised when he won. And then the world just didn't know how to process it. It's weird because uh, in today's political ambience, like some people, you know, follow a party, others follow a, a character. It's like a cult of personality. And that seems to be the case with Trump, which makes it very interesting. You can even do this like a mix of satire for one side and, and a serious take of drama from the other side, trying to analyze the reason why he has such different reactions from people. It would be a very interesting biopic. Time. Okay. Uh, so five minute free form when one of you starts talking, I will throw up the one minute warning on screen when that comes. If I feel like someone's talking over <laughs> the other person or not giving uh, up time, I will throw up the let's move on. Don't do that. It'll make me sad. Um, but five minute free form when one of you starts. Talking. You go. You go ahead, Nazar, if you want. I actually think uh, you can do an approach kind of like uh, Dr. Parnassus when you can cast two people as Donald Trump. And just make it one side when it's very satirical, do something obvious like Alec Baldwin from SNL and then make a very serious pick. I don't know, maybe 
uh, Christian Bale or like a Michael Chiklis doing the the other dramatic part. It's it's a weird mix. Like I said, it's an interesting reaction to see how people follow him for one reason or another, and how the, he doesn't seem to really understand what's going on. My main issues with Trump is mostly around his kind of overexposure and oversaturation. I mean, you mentioned it with like the Alec Baldwin SNL thing. I know we don't talk TV a lot, but you're talking about a political figure who's, you know, in the spotlight consistently. So I think with that, with the Brendan Gleeson movie that we had on HBO a while ago, I just think there would be this oversaturation of Trump, uh, especially as he's ramping up with the things that he is going on in his life. And he's already, McKay's already done a conservative blowhard who's been hell bent on consolidating power when he did vice. So I was just thinking about how he can move away necessarily from the political landscape. And Benjamin Franklin isn't just a political figure, but he's an industrialist and an entrepreneur. He's all these different sides of him that McKay hasn't tackled yet, which I thought would make for an interesting situation. Plus, we haven't had a full scope look into Benjamin Franklin's life in a feature film. I don't think uh, McKay would be the right choice for that. I think if you want to look at the one of the lives of our Amer- of America's biggest forefathers, not my America, <laughs> uh, you need like a more serious filmmaker because I think McKay's style is actually too modern for it. And if you try to implement those satirical elements that he's so famous for in a story like Ben Franklin's, I think it may clash and like take you out of the movie because if you see his the type of movies he has done it's always bending more to the modern stuff and yes he did uh uh i forgot his name uh god damn it vice president in vice dick cheney uh dick cheney yes he did cheney but trump is like not really cheney at all trump it's literally like somebody who accidentally uh failed upwards and somehow gain a blind following of like half the country and no one can really understand why. And I think that is very interesting to explore. Well, I mean, people know why it's because he's a billionaire in America and we have this hair horrible, you know, wage gap, 1% and whatnot. Um, you mentioned the idea of the satirical <laughs> thing, bringing down sort of the story of Benjamin Franklin, but the general public only knows sort of the, the highs that he had hit as the discoverer. The tight stuff, yeah the proclivity of him as an inventor and writer, but it's not until recently that we learned about sort of his seedy underbelly of how he lived his social life as sort of a sexual deviant and how he took on a lot of sexual partners, um, how he had STDs. There's a lot of funny parts about Benjamin Franklin that got hit a little bit in a drunk history episode, but hasn't been expanded upon after that. And uh, I think, uh, and then there's the addition of the fact that Benjamin Franklin owned a newspaper and he was actually the first arbiter of the idea of fake news because he put out a story about a bunch of uh, Native American scalping settlers at the behest of the British to make dissent amongst uh, European nations against the British. But that never happened. So actually, Benjamin Franklin is sort of more like Trump than you would think necessarily, but he did it first. And plus, there's other interesting angles around that. So I think you, I don't, you I don't think go that with that. I don't think you can use the he did it first part because we're talking about a forefather and a person that is currently alive. So it, it's like things are cyclical. Things happen again. And just because it's happened once doesn't mean that it can happen again and better. We're talking about a man who basically incited a coup. Uh, he he made an, uh, uh, a bunch of his followers attack the White House for a stealing an election that he never actually stole, that they never actually won and convince half the country to fight in, her, in his name while he just disappeared for a few months and then decided to come back and say, oh, yeah, uh, yes, I won and, and you followed me, but now you are the ones getting arrested and facing the consequences. Except that now, years later, apparently, they realize, you know what, maybe this guy was at fault. It's, it's an interesting thing. It's, a, it's somebody who projects to be a successful person, to be a business smart guy, but he kept White House secret documents in his dining table on his house for no reason. He just took them because he felt like it. I mean, like, Biden does that too. He, he's done that as well. But I, I would say that if you wanted to do a Trump thing, okay. I think it would make more sense to do it later on as opposed to now when we get all the legal stuff out of the way. So that time. All right. Uh, Nazario, you are going to get to close first. You have one minute when you start. <laughs> Um, like I said, it's to me, it's the, the duality of the situation what makes Trump an interesting 
subject for this. I think McKay has the edge, the satire, the, for the satirical part down. And like I said, you can use two set of actors. You can even use two set of actors for all the following the people of uh, Mike Pence and of course the Fox News reporters, like everybody who was important in the in the rise of Donald Trump. But at the same time, it's really difficult for me to understand that divide. And I think it would be an interesting thing to analyze in a, in a movie because for some people, they are just dumbfounded of how this situation happened, how this guy became president, how can he still be relevant this many years after? He's about to uh, jump again, trying to be a president again. And on the other side, you have people who blindly follow him, identify with him, and just say, like, yes, this is who represents me. This is my true values. And I've never seen the United States more divided than after he was president. It's incredible. Okay. Uh, we're going to move over to Robert. Robert, you have one minute when you start talking. Nazar is waxing a lot about the political climate, but that's why Donald Trump is so such an important figure with regards to satire on SNL. And frankly, a lot of what Donald Trump does on his own is a satire unto itself, How what he says, how what he does, how he looks. So I think McKay would be wasted in this sense because it undercuts what he wants to do as a satirical player. I think Benjamin Franklin opens up because we mostly know him as a serious person, but he has this undercurrent of social uh, social oddness that we haven't actually touched yet. Um, there's a lot of theaters of what Franklin has done that McKay hasn't touched as a director, which I think would be interesting for him. And I think for Trump, if you wanted to do a motion picture, I think it would be something that you should wait later on when we get the legal ramifications of things that have happened out of the way, when we get past this next um, election. I don't think it's something that you could focus on right now. I think it would be wasted for McKay's talents. I think Benjamin Franklin brings all the elements that would make a good McKay film together the best. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm going to bring in the judges. <clears throat> the judges spelled D-A. Yeah. <laughs> D-12. Um, I last went a lot better than I expected to go. This fight. I've seen this argument in chats before. I was right. given instructions. I I appreciate that. You guys good, judges? Yeah. Yep. All right, I'm gonna go first. Um, I went with Robert. Um, I think that Nazario actually uh, had me in the opening. I thought that Robert's like opening pitch was not very interesting and i thought that um nazario's was uh but as we got into the main part of the debate um i thought that nazario started to kind of lose me um and robert was explaining more and more about franklin and was doing a good job of taking down trump of saying like we already had the brendan gleason um uh, mini series we already have him in snl like the he's always at the forefront um and i thought robert's closing remark about that it, right now mckay doing a movie about trump would be wasting his talents but if we waited until after a lot of this has blown over that would be when it would be more interesting um so i went with robert cody do we disagree like normal on the first question or <laughs> uh are we yeah so when I saw the question, I thought there was a slam dunk pick. I thought it was Trump um, because of just Adam McKay's climate of what he's doing currently. And I think it would play into it. But I think Robert did a really good job of taking that down and saying, like, it falls into the same realm of some of the stuff. And then the overplay of Trump being, like, we've seen it played out a lot of times. I also thought... Nazario had me at the beginning too because he did make sense. But then again, questions like this, it's kind of hard. I kind of put myself, it's unfair to some degree, but it's how I judge her. Is which one, like, I think would make the better movie, which one I would see, like, which one would make sense from him to do, kind of forming that form of question. And I knew a lot of the stuff about Benjamin Franklin, but then when Robert brought that up, it made it even more fascinating. Like, yeah, kind of would like to see that play out um so i had to go with robert all right mark uh your vote doesn't count where would you have gone and why oh it would have been clean sweet i also went with robert um 
kind of for a lot of the reasons you guys said. Uh, I I kind of uh, really gravitated, at least what Robert said, at least right now, doing a Trump movie would feel a little weird, especially since I don't think we know the full ramifications of everything that uh, I think of everything that, you know, has been affected by Trump. And I think as the further along, I think Robert explained about the Ben, the, what this Ben Franklin movie looked like, it sounded more interesting. And on some level, I do think Nazario kind of repeated himself on some of the things he said about his movie. He didn't he literally get arrested again today? He yeah. Did. yeah, he went to Atlanta and he had to swear. And yes. Nice. Uh, all right. So uh, Robert wins the first point. Uh, we're going to move over to the next question, which was drafted by Nazario. I'm very excited about this one. We've got what 1940s Disney movie would be better if it was made with today's CG style animation. Uh, so Nazario, you get to kick this one off. You have one minute to open your argument when you start talking. The 1940s uh, Disney movies are mostly package films, which are shorts based on a central idea or a central theme and trying to like fill out 90 minutes. Some of them are not, but most of them are. And what I feel is the best one that could enjoy this kind of style would be uh, The Adventures of Ichabod the Mr. Toad. Because to me, CGI does its best when it helps you define motion and camera shots for things you couldn't do in traditional animation back in the 40s. Uh, the Mr. Toad segment is full of uh, chases and action and cars and airplanes. And it's very dynamic. And I think a CGI animated style can actually improve on that a lot, that you are very limited when you're doing classic animation. And for the Sleepy Hollow segment, then you can have some fun. You can go deeper. You can go darker. We have seen uh, CGI movies made uh, for more grown-up uh, uh, kids, like Monsters House, for example, that have that element of horror. And if you utilize that technology, you can make it really scary. Time. Okay. Uh, we're going to move over to Robert. Robert, you have one minute to open your argument when you start talking. When I was thinking about this, and Nazario's right, it was just a lot of package films uh, with central ideas that didn't really have a, like a set plot device. Um, but when I was thinking about this question, I was thinking about what could be made less, uh, what seems a little bit stuck in the past with regards to not having that modern CGI styling. And I went with Fantasia. Now, I'm not going to say Fantasia is bad without modern animation, but I think there's these timeless classical orchestral pieces, Nutcracker Suite, Rite of Spring, Takata and Fugue, being played to create these settings, these imagined visualizations, uh, when they appear on screen, it doesn't seem to match up. The, these 40 style animations doesn't really click with that timelessness of what's going on with the music. So I think a featured update would allow the visuals to more meet the expectation of what's going on with the audio. Um, there's some troubling depictions. We have that message in Disney Plus uh, before you watch the film that um, from a story song, telling standpoint that I think with CGI, if you redo it, it can be a little bit more representative, more inclusive. Um, there's a reason Fantasia 2000 exists. They wanted to redo it. And I think another bump forward with CGI would just make it even more modern. Fantasia 3000. No, I'm just yeah. kidding. <laughs> All right, uh, guys, five minute free form. When <laughs> we're talking. So uh, with your pick, Nazario, um, half of the story of Ichabod and Mr. Toad has already sort of been adapted and modernized in a few different ways. And I'm talking about the Sleepy Hollow version with a movie called Sleepy Hollow with a show that was called Sleepy Hollow. Uh, so I don't really know what modernization pushing that forward. Twenty, I don't really know what that does for the sake of the darkness. Like t Tim Burton did a dark telling of that with pretty modern... Uh, Not for kids, though. Feelings. I mean, yes, but I mean, you can there's still a, a situation where it has been pushed forward. And then with regards to the Mr. Toad part, I think modern CGI uh, with regards to the animal parts has a situation where you lose expressiveness, like what happens with the Lion King. Like you talked about some of the action parts, but like there's a big part that takes place in uh, a courtroom. And I think the idea of modernizing it to the point where you have it sort of reflect that will make it lose sort of the effectiveness of that part, which is where that if you, that is only if you choose to do it Lion King style, which is realistic animals. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm talking more Pixar style animals, which is the, the ones that are cute, that are memorable, that you remember and that you love. And that works because the action in this and the camera shots can be a lot more dynamic with CG. Uh, 
when as talking about Sleepy Hollow, it's not about uh, making it darker for darkness sake. You do have the Tim Burton movie. You have that shitty TV series that nobody watched. But if you make it scary for kids in the style of the more modern made for kids horror uh, movies like the ones they've done in stop animation or with cgi like monster house then you tap into something fantasia though you're saying you want to modernize the visuals because they did not match the time those animated pieces were made specifically for those pieces of music they basically told the artist this is the song do whatever you feel like and that connects that there's a connection that is ingrained between each other you cannot change the animation just because you can and try to get that same nostalgic feeling that you get back then. You already tried to just update it with Fantasia 2000 and nobody remembers that. Not even the flying wings. Well, I mean, that was meant, that was set up because they thought, you know, evolution would be beneficial for the sake of that. And plus they, they just wanted to add like stars to it because they thought it would help with like the in-between parts of what Fantasia 2000 and it didn't. And you're right. But At all. Um, Fantasia was, it, it's sort of meant to be experimental, I think based on quite how you explained it. There's a spirit of why it was made, why it could push boundaries. And I think the idea of setting up modern CGI makes a sense for it to be a bold undertaking of what can be in the future. I was just thinking about, if you look at Fantasia, how scary could the Chernabog sequence be on Bald Mountain with updated CGI or how graceful the ballet with the hippos and the elephants. I think it's a little bit stilted because you have that. And it's fine if you, talk about the nostalgia purpose, but I'm talking about not getting rid of it, but evolving it for the sake of meeting up and matching what's going on with the the timelessness of the audio. There's not a yeah, timelessness of the visual. At that point, you start messing with the originality and creativity of the situation. Like I said, the original intention of Fantasia was listen to this piece of music, create some animation around it. And like I said, it may be a little dated by, you know, 70 years later, but it's still something that was created specifically for that piece of music. And if you just replace it with CGI just because you think it looks prettier and doesn't really add nothing, you're just taking away the original intent of the artist. And if you evolve it, like Fantasia 2000 did, which was Walt Disney's original spirit, he never wanted Fantasia to end, then you're not really remaking Fantasia. You're just making another sequel. You take one or two pieces of music that are like the one people remember. You can do a little clip for each of those and you add like seven new pieces. And that, my friend, is just a sequel. With Sleepy Hollow, you actually remake uh, the stories from the books and use the elements of the current technology to make it more appealing to make it action heavier in the, on the Mr. Toad segment, to make it scarier on the a segment. Can you imagine an uh, animated Pixar-style CGI chase through the woods with the ho- with the, the Headless Horseman? That is something that would appeal to everybody, and it would make it work. I also, given the pick you made, I'm not sure how improved animation CGI, I don't know how we'd be able to mesh together a dual story in two segments uh, in a similar way that they could get away with in the 40s. They're sort of disparate stories. They're married together because they're, you know, classic storytelling thing. And and you're talking about, I, I think, the animation style of the idea of opening up a storybook, for instance, and uh, having that classical nature of it being classical novelization. I think it reduces the effectiveness of that idea that we're looking at a uh, what is a classic of literature by pushing it forward with a CGI and then trying to mesh them together when they don't really mesh together in modern it's times. Just, uh, it's just a device to join the stories together, reading books. Okay. It works. It works. Strike it from the record. Uh, we're going to start with Robert. Robert, you get one minute to close when you start talking. I'm not talking about getting rid of the spirit of what Fantasia was about. I think the idea of modernizing the CGI so that the visuals meet with the audio is something that could help push it forward further past what Fantasia 2000 tried to be and into something that could be a little bit more timeless going along with the sake of the what's going on with those classical pieces of uh, orchestral music. Uh, with regards to Ichabod and Mr. Toad, modernizations of half of that. I don't care the idea that you're using Pixar style CGI. We still have modernized versions of the story of Sleepy Hollow. And then for Mr. Toad, um, there's dynamism in the story, but a lot of it takes place with them just sitting and talking. I don't know what modern CGI does. I don't know how it is that you mesh these two types of stories together for the sake of one feature film. If you talked about, I mean, you can't separate we're talking about one film, so I'm not really sure what it is modern CGI does to improve that. I don't think it really fits together for the sake of trying to evolve it. That's, I, 
doesn't make sense to me. Time. Okay. Uh, we're going to move over to Nazario. Nazario, you have one minute to close when you start talking. It makes sense in the way that you can have two shorter stories and put them together as classic literatures that they are being narrated to you by a person, it, like being Crosby did it back in the 40s. You can improve the segments the way I did, like the way I mentioned. There is a lot of action. There's a lot of chasing and vehicles and, and, and speed on the Mr. Toad segment. And there is a lot of, of huntness, horror, scary moments in Sleepy Hollow. You can use the technology to improve what is already a classic content. And it's just a retelling of a classic story because classic stories are retold millions of times. What you're trying to do to Fantasia is to alter a product that was created specifically to join these visuals and this music. These visuals were born out of this music. If you change it, then it's not the same product anymore. It becomes a little bit more soulless. And you cannot and, and you cannot tell me that expanding it does not basically turn it into a sequel because yes, that is keeping some music, adding new music that makes it different, which makes it a sequel, no longer a remake. Okay. Uh, we're going to bring in the judges. Hello, Maggie and Bucky. Welcome. All right. Uh, Mark, you're going first on this one. Cool. Uh, I want to start off by saying I did watch two seasons of that Sleepy Hollow show on Fox. <laughs> I did not. It wasn't very great. Uh, you all skipped it. You were right for doing so. Was... Oh, Bahari. We all, we all remember. <laughs> I didn't know it existed. Yeah. You're better off for it. Uh, I did go with Nazario. Um, I I think he sold me more and kind of what I think what I think he sold me more of what would make his movie different if it were made today where I feel like he he more or less explained kind of how how like the scenes would pop a little bit more how the story would be more engaging and I think he he just made the right points to kind of strike down like like kind of like make like in the sense of like why would we just kind of do a Fantasia movie again where one, we already did it and like in some, in some sense, would it kind of skirt the original intent of what Fantasia was back then? Okay. Um, I also went with Nazario. Um, I thought that um, I agree with Mark for the most part, especially on the criticisms against Fantasia. I thought uh, Nazario did a, did a good job of kind of being able to say like, no, like you're just kind of pitching a, a sequel. Like I get where Robert was coming from, but I thought Nazario's like whole takedown of that was really strong. Um, as for his pros against uh, or his pros for his movie, um, I thought they were very strong as well. Like what Mark said, like how the movie would pop um, a lot more, but just kind of going from the question that the, the animation upgrade whether you see it as an upgrade or not, but uh, the animation uplift for Ichabod and Mr. Toad would benefit the movie and it would not benefit Fantasia. So, uh, Cody, your vote doesn't count. Where would you have gone and why? I just love that you wrote his first and last name on your board. That's just like, it's respectful. Um, so, both of these movies suck, like the originals, if we're being fair. They do suck. Um, only if you change your hair color and have a receding hairline would you consider one of these movies your like all time favorite. Um, shout out Caleb Coho. Uh, but on that note, uh, hi Maggie. What are you doing? Uh, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, she, she did the forgetting Sam Marshall. <laughs> um, but I think I took it to the CGI style and basically 
what like who sold me on why the CGI is the most important into the story. That's why I also had to go with Rosario. Um, I just feel like he sold it better. And like I, it didn't work for me that it's like, oh, you'll get the lifeness, lifeless if you switch up the things, but you're also pitching Fantasia, so I kinda like applied that to both. Hello, buddy. He's trying to murder somebody over there. <laughs> well, you brought a child in this house in like, 10, 10 million years. We we left it's Maggie's birthday and we went to dinner tonight and we were getting hey, ready. And he went over to his leash and started like sniffing it and was like, I could come right. And we were like, Oh my god, I'm sorry. So he's he's a little wound up. Um you voted for Nazario, yes. <laughs> Bodie, <laughs> sorry, I missed all of it. Uh, okay, so we are going to move on to the... He's like trying to murder Do you want to do a cut or anything? Or no, we're going to gonna just keep rolling. It's love it, love. <laughs> Leaving it in, leaving it in. Um, so uh, we're going to move on yeah. to the next question. We are t- tied up one-to-one. The next question uh, was in the category of American Spot. <laughs> And the question is, what is the coolest action scene in a Bourne film? Uh, so, Robert, you get to kick this one off. You have one minute when you start talking. I'm not going to use it to define cool in an action scene, but say most of the scenes you get in Bourne movies usually feature Bourne or Aaron Cross. Uh, in a shootout, car chase, fight scene with another like skilled assassin. It turns into a comic book mirror fight, and then Bourne or Aaron Cross prevails because they have an angle of being a better fighter or driver or whatever. So I chose the Moscow chase in Bourne Supremacy. I chose that because there's the situation where we have this connection with Carl Urban's Kirill because he has been on Bourne and trying to um, frame him from the beginning. And he even kills Marie. So there's a lot of uh, connection background of this cat and mouse game that they've been playing. Plus, we, Jason Bourne's been shot. So the whole premise of that scene is that he's depowered. De- so it isn't crazy to believe that Carl Urban could actually gain the upper hand on him. Uh, and it has this high octane action, this cat and mouse game, as I mentioned, tracking Bourne through the streets. Um, and it's this hunter prey sort of situation uh where it plays out in such an interesting way and that's why i chose time okay uh we're gonna move over to nazario nazario you have one minute to open your argument when you start talking you are muted okay this movies kind of blend together don't they like you remember the jason Bourne movies are cool uh, you remember that they're good every time you rewatch them. But other than the fact that Famke Jansen appears in one and then dies, it's really difficult to pinpoint things, except for the scene in Tangiers, uh, the chase where Bourne follows uh, Dash to try to stop him from getting to Julia Stiles. It's amazing. This is before the John Wick times, uh, before even uh, the more modern uh, James Bond ones, where you could get really inventive for the first time in the chase. And I think this one in particular, it's memorable because it has several elements. It has a part where there's a bomb explode and he chases in motorcycles and he starts following him. He loses it. They start jumping through buildings. And and all this time you have the tension that that Bourne is not going to be able to catch him and he's not going to be able to save her. And since it's supposed to be the last movie, it's also a very real thing that she could die. And that you will get very invested in the, in the thing. All right, uh, five minute free form when one of you starts. This died, so I'll do it like this. Uh, the other thing is that there's some very inventive camera work in this. Like they do a lot of close quarter fighting, and you can see how they started doing techniques that would later get used in movies like the John Wick series. But my favorite one it's the one where Bourne is following him, jumping building to building. And he actually like jumps from one building through a window and falls on Dash on the other side of the building and the camera follows him. How did they do that? I don't know, but it never lost me. And then they just fight on close quarters, which becomes very intimate, very close. It's a very memorable scene and it's skillfully directed. Yours has cars. It doesn't just have cars. It has a lot of cool shots. There's the shot where they're chasing each other parallel across the river, this dynamic shooting. There's the part where they sort of meet eye to eye and lock. Um, When they turn the cameras around, when they're going through the tunnel and they're using the different cars, bumper cars, buffers between them, uh, Bourne takes out uh, cops, uh, one armed basically, and he uses alcohol, which is sort of his object of choice. He always has an object. Uh, You're talking about Franca Patente, by the way, is Maria who gets killed. What did Uh, I say? 
you, you, don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. Either way. Um, I My problem with your scene, it Nazario, is like yeah, it's, it, my problem with your scene, Nazario, is it's, I, I'm not really sure. There's so many elements to it. I mean, there's like too many. There's the bombing of Neil Daniels. There's the trailing of the motorbikes. There's the foot chase in the crowd. There's the pursuit of the cops, the running on rooftops, the actual fight. There's so much. And then and forth between the Situation Room in New York, which is not exciting whatsoever. And you talked about- That's exactly my point, man. It is. It involves so many elements. It makes, They blow up the explosion where you, you're just like, okay, this shouldn't have happened and it's a distraction. And that's why Desh gets the advantage and he starts running away. Bohr starts following him. The, the only mode of transportation they find is the Vespas. And they start following with the Vespas in the small little corridors through the city, which is very exciting. Julia Stiles is waiting. She realizes that something's happening. She starts running. And then they change. In, they cannot follow on the Vespa. They change into a rooftop. And the camera just comes with them. The, the dynamic way that is filmed is very exciting and memorable. The thing with yours is that, yes, it's it may be a good car chase but there are so many movies with car chases. You have the, the Fast and Furious one, the, the early ones at least had cars. You have the, the Italian job. You have, do you know which one is great? Running with Robert De Niro. Most people don't watch that movie. That has way better car chases than anything in this movie. Okay, so going back to yours for a second. Uh, I'm sorry, I like Julia Stiles, but there's too much reliance on her in the action scene as a victim, and it takes away from the dynamism of the scene between Bourne and Desh. It's just her involvement, and then her involvement in the fight is just ridiculous. And then going to something we know about further, you talked about how it was cool about him jumping the buildings, but as we learned in the Bourne legacy, we learn essentially that they are drugged to be essential superheroes. So the idea, it kind of cheapens the idea of what's going on because they're super powered. I, I prefer it when Dude, it's more really? realistic on, yes, I prefer it when it's more realistic on the ground and Bourne is injured as he's going through my that was retcon on a sequel that didn't even have Jason Bourne in it to, to lessen the natural visceral reaction we had to a great scene. Like if you say that about my movie, well, he was driving like a madman in yours because he was a superhero. Come on, man. Don't go the cheap was, way. But in, mine, in mine, he was shot and he was depowered, so it feels more realistic. Bullets well, take powers away from superheroes. Nice. I like it. No. I, what I'm, well, he was affected because he was hobbling through the streets, so it seemed like he was affected. And by the way, the, the car chase scene, there's a the tunnel part at the end of my scene has this claustrophobia that you don't really get from a lot of other car scenes. I mentioned the bumper cards playing. They're playing like vehicular chess. It's incredible. It's not just a physical thing. It's a mental game between them. And like I said, we have this connection. With yours, we just met Desh like 10 minutes earlier. There's no like mm -hmm. historical he's context behind villain. it. He's not even the main villain. Yes. He's not even the main villain, but but Carl Urban is the main villain. So it, it comes comes to a climax with this. And Bourne doesn't even kill him. We don't even know what happens to Carl Urban at the end. Just that, you know, he's in bad shape in the car. So it has like this mystery element too. Like we don't know if he might come back. I have no idea. That does, the fact that you're bringing sequels that don't even have Jason Bourne in it or things that might have happened to try to explain how your scene has more meaningful things, does it make you see that you are missing the point? They said the coolest action scene, coolest action scene on this can exist on a bubble. And what I'm saying is that your bubble is a thing that has been done a million times before in better movies with better action scenes. Bullet, vanishing point, even gone in 60 seconds has great car chases. You talk about claustrophobic. We are running Vespas in in the in freaking hallways between buildings. You are the camera never loses him, and it's so exciting because it it just keeps Sorry. going with you. All right, we're gonna start with uh, Nazario. Nazario, you have one minute to close your argument when you start talking. Okay, uh, what I'm saying is. If you see it on a, on an island, just just select the bubble and you put the action scene. Mine has several components, which makes it more memorable, makes it more exciting. It starts with a bomb, follows with a, a motor motor vehicle chase, jumps into a street race, jumps into a building parkour style. It's the it's, it's the one of the first times that you can actually see the type of parkour doing as part of an action film. Yes, Julia Style gets involved. She actually has to save jo Jason Bourne for a second from Dash, and then he grabs him and. They have such an intimate final moment where they fight to the death this way. It's it's a memorable bubble scene. It's, it's beautiful. And it doesn't have the biggest ramifications. Dash is not the most important person in the series. That is not the question. 
if you're saying that the things that makes yours better is the fact that he got shot on a leg and he could overcome that, dude, the guy was crashing through buildings to, to the scene I'm talking about. And again, it's just a car chase. It's a great car chase. There are many great car chases. That's not special. I couldn't even tell if it was part of the first one or second movie. Second movie, strike it from the record. Uh, we're going to move over to Robert. Robert, you have one minute to close your argument when you start talking. Don't be swayed by this Nazari argument. There's a lot of car chases. Not a lot of car chases have situations where you have people going back and forth through the entirety of the movie, and then they're using their physical advantages and their mental advantages to try to get one up on each other, ending in what is very dynamic and claustrophobic car scene. Uh, Nazari talks about all the elements of his. It's too many elements. There's a lot of respites in it that takes away uh, from the action of it. And I don't give a crap about Vespas. Vespas are boring a motor vehicle to use. Uh, we have no connection with Dash. He's not the main villain. There's a lot of things that cheapen what's going on in the Chan Tangiers chase, especially with the involvement of the police. That seems a lot tacked on. And we have close quarter fights. I mean, there's a lot of close quarter fights that have been used throughout history of film, and this isn't even done particularly well. The idea that Dash can get the drop on Bourne with the bombing that happens, that he that he gets the drop on him and that the fighting going on is unrealistic with my scene. It's, it's dynamic because of what the historical context is and the action and the shots in it. And Nazari is like too much going on time. Oh boy, boys. Sup. That was a good one. Um, okay. Does anybody else just write two names on the board, and when the fight's over, you just erase one of them? That's a good um, idea. I, I used to, I, I used to do that, <laughs> then I stopped doing that. Yeah, because you say you say awesome stuff for each person at some point. I don't think you did that last night. Um, no. It, sometimes I str if I if the fight's really good, like, and I'm struggling to like decide, I take less time to. I just I get a name down. Um, okay, Cody is starting on this one. I don't know who had in trivia used to like swing the board like that, but uh, was that oh. a Adams thing. No, I know. No. Uh, I know you're talking about that. Oh, crap. Um, so these are f tough fights because, like, coolest, like, sell me on cool. Um, I don't know if Nazaria could ever sell me on cool. The man buys toys. But listen, um, <laughs> overall, I think the fight was really interesting because I think one person targeted the scene. One person like gave a lot of context around why stuff is. And that didn't really hold much weight for me because I needed it to be like why the scene was overall cool. Yes, Nazario kind of got repetitive repeated like it's a car chase like all these things but he also he backed it up with googled great chase scenes or whatever in scenes like he did he did enough to cover all the bases on that and you were explaining like crazy scenes and i think he backed it up where you're doing the car and survived by a gunshot but healing is like well in my scene they're doing all this stuff on top of it it was just a love hill battle for me nazario was running away with it on certain just he kept piling and making Robert go into directions I don't think Robert wanted to fight on. Like, he was trying to sway it, but, like, Nazario is kind of insufferable. <laughs> so when he's, like, mentioning, he's like, hey, it's a car chase, dude. Like, come on. A sequel? Who cares? Like, and that just gets people off the rhythm. So I had to go Nazario. But I may be. How about you? Uh, Mark, you're going next. Uh, yeah. I'll say this uh, for both of you. You guys, uh, I would say you picked the two obje objectively correct answers. I would say for this uh, for this question, and um, I I mean I'm I'm kind of inclined to agree with Cody on this one because I did, I did go with Nazario as well. Like um, I I feel like it, as a long because I feel like Robert when went along like there was a lot of like a Nazario scene has a lot of elements in it. I feel like Nazario for big swaths of, like kind of ex like thoroughly explained everything that went on in this and it didn't it never sounded like it was too much. And then Robert would kind of throw in some blows and I think Nazario just kind of just 
you know, like uh, shooed them off pretty well, like throughout. So, yeah, like yeah, I give them to Zario. Okay, uh, my vote doesn't count, but it's another clean sweep. Um, so I thought that you like that one, Zario. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> but um, I I. I forget which one of you said it. I think it was Nazario said it that it's these movies are kind of hard to remember which one is which. I tend to agree. I like all three. I even like Born Legacy. The only one I don't like really is Jason Bourne. Um, and um, the first three I think are all movies that I really enjoy watching while I'm watching them, but I have no idea like which one is which at certain points. Like I know Ultimatum is the one I always enjoy the most but I couldn't tell you anything that happens in that other than like maybe one scene that I'm thinking of with uh, what's his fuck Edgar Ramirez. So uh, the context of, from the scenes from the players helped very much to guide me to what scenes they were talking about, but I still was struggling to like, remember what part of the movie it was and everything. And at the end of the day, I think (laughs) told me more on why his was cooler um I, I i didn't take much weight in the um uh car chase thing like when nazario was just listing off other movies i'm like well the other movies don't matter like we're talking about within the jason Bourne series like why they're why these are cool scenes um and uh so that didn't really hold weight for me but i thought on the whole he did do a better job of explaining why his scene overall is just cooler uh so i went with nazario uh that means nazario is up two to one and um robert needs to hit this next one in order to send it to the bonus so the question is in the category of actors and actresses and the question is what is the funniest moment from muse jason muse in a film uh so nazario you get to kick this off you have one minute when you start talking Jay and Silent Bob are, have always been the linchpin of the Kevin Smith VOS universe. Uh, but by the time they make Clerks 2, sixth movie of the series, uh, the joke had kind of run its course. Uh, one was silent, the other was uh, very, very vulgar. And it was funny <laughs> in Clerks, a uh, little bit on Mall Rats, and then I think it started to lose its luster. By this time, it, they were lovable characters, yes, but they were not funny anymore, and you needed to do something drastic. So what do they do? Well, the new and improved Jay and Silent Bob uh, got arrested. Uh, they were sent to rehab where they found Jesus. And they are now newborn uh, Christians who not only believe in the Lord and want to spread his word, they also want to sell you wheat. But how can they do this, you ask? Like, it not fall back into their old, you know, practices, vices. Uh, well, because they read the Bible, sir. The motherfucking Bible. time okay uh so we're gonna move over to robert robert you have one minute when you start talking so nazari's right uh jane silent bob where this linchpin this through line between these non-complementary stories in the view universe so that you know there's continuity you can follow them along as observers guild uh rosencrantz and guildenstern uh but when they started to shift focus away so they got their own films we see flashes of what makes them compelling overall i think the joke was still funny and even funnier as the focus became on them uh, as a duo and there are moments in the movie I picked, Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, that show that Jason Mewes can cook alone. And none better than the key example that I'm picking, which is the fuck song that he sings at the beginning of Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. The song's meant to kick off this expectation for the movie. It's just a lot of flowery, a lot of flowery means for Jay to curse. And he does that in droves here. It's wonderful. It, it picks up and it really senses that Jason Mewes can be a person who you rely on for comedy. It's not just complimentary as someone to come in and do comments. You can put the focus on him uh, and it makes sense. And you can have a a full movie dedicated to them, their dynamic, how it is they play off each other. But Jason Mewes can stand forefront and that's done so kicking off Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back in this moment. Time. Okay. Um, All right. Five minute freeform when one of you starts talking. So every characteristic that makes Jay a fun character is on display in my scene with the singing, the dancing, the the pop culture references they make, his interaction with 
uh, with Bob, with Simon Bob, when they're dancing and uh, getting involved with the song. It weaves in uh, how he works well as part of a duo, but also how he can stand on his own as a comedic presence. The construct of your scene, Nazario, it's, it's funny. I'm not going to say it's not funny, but I don't think the delivery does it justice. I think Jay works best, Jason Muse when he is bombastic, when he gets a chance to really go forward and push forward with the language that he wants. And I think the idea of them coming out of rehab and him being mellowed, which he's mellowed in real life when they're doing it, takes away from the effectiveness of Jay. Uh, so I would say my scene's funnier because it plays into what makes Jay funnier, which is him with bombast. So basically you're saying that he proves that he can be a character in a lead of a movie because he says Fox like 50 times, right? Uh, that's no, I'm not, saying it's uh, a dynamic song is all. Yeah, he says fuck like 50 times. And pe some people laugh because they're children and then they're seeing James Allen Bob for the first time because this is the one movie that they actually kind, kind of like a wide release. All everything before was kind of indie and more short run. So fine, if it's your first time, I get it. This is the fifth film in that series and that joke was already played out. The scene I'm using actually shows that they can have depth. It shows that the characters have grown from movie to movie. And even though they have grown, they have not lost what they, what is essential to their own characters. Like they are sober, yes. They're trying to not smoke weed while selling weed, which is a hilarious concept in itself. And yet, you when they start talking about, you know, I would have been an astronaut. I would have been a. I could have been a doctor, a veterinarian. I could have gone to another world. And you're thinking, wow, Jay has really grown up. Maybe he's not going to be as funny anymore. And he's like, yeah, I would be the first person to find an alien life form. And fuck it. People will see me walking on the street and say, homeboy fucked a Martian once. Dude, that is that is actual growth. That is actual using a few profanities from explaining how a character has reached a point in his life where he's already reaching middle age and, and he can think back on his life and really be as stupid as it is. What they prove in Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, putting him as a lead, they have to dumb him down. He's always been goofy. He's always been vulgar. But the main joke of that movie that you're referring to is that he's dumb and he doesn't get what people are talking about. That is not even the joke that is portrayed in the, the Fox song that you're saying sets him up. I would say then you don't have the best handle on what makes Jay funny. I think it's how I think he, he expresses uh, how he can curse in such a, a great way through the song that I think it plays into. Uh, what makes him such a dynamic lead character, what it can as a comedy. I think in, in Clerks 2, Nazario, there are funnier scenes with Jay and Silent Bob overall. There's the Buffalo uh, Bill scene where he pretends to be Buffalo Bill and applies the makeup. There's when he tucks in his junk uh, when he pretends to do that. Uh, the the dancing scene, the ABCs, when he has the, uh, the pigtails. I think there's a lot of other scenes that are funnier with regards to Clerks 2. And I think both of these scenes, in essence, are very similarly structured. Mine came first, and I think the way that uh, the dialogue is set up. I think it hits harder and funnier in mine at a much quicker pace. And I think that's what makes Jay funnier overall there. Uh, I think the people he interacts with, with the drug deal in mine as kids is funnier than the people that you have. And I just think my scene crawled. He actually, so sings, the same, uh, he actually sings the same song. I know, but in mine did it first. But it's box, great. little man, put that shit in my hand. It's not no, because funny. he's more grown up. He's not going to keep singing fuck, 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 fuck to the people he's trying to convince to follow the Lord because he's doing in another message now. And if you want to point out other funny scenes in a movie, funnier scenes in Jay and Silent Bob are when he's learning what the internet is, when he goes to Holden, and when he finds out how he can use his money that he got from everything he fought for in the movie to fly around the United States kicking children's asses because they call him names on the internet. That is way funnier than the Fox song. The Fox song is just reusing the one joke he used to have, which is being bolder, putting it to a song and saying, yeah. And how does that scene end? Talking about Morris Day and the time yeah. being their favorite band. That, that is fun. That is not funny. The thing is, mine grows because he keeps going. He learns to be a different human being. Yes, he has other scenes, uh, funny scenes in the movie, but he always keeps pushing the religious angle. And in the end, what does he do? He becomes a selfless person. He uses the money he still has left from the children's he didn't kick his ass from, to donate it to the clerk so they can buy back the quick shop. It's a more meaningful character moment. It is a, a funnier scene because it shows growth. It shows that Jay can have a different base and yet be hilarious. It's the best Jay.
but I don't think in terms of for comedic scene, using your argument against you in the last debate, this is a time capsule. We're looking at it in a bottle. What does growth have to do with the comedy? You brought the, the other scenes. Right. Okay. Uh, so we're going to start with Robert. Robert, you have one minute to close when you start talking. I think if you just look at the fuck song just as a means to be vulgar, I think you're missing the point. I think it's the idea of how it is that Jay goes about setting up cadence and delivery. He's trying to do a drug deal, but he's he's setting up and and how it is he's dynamic with Bob, uh, how it moves into Jungle Love as a song and explaining about Morse Day in the Time, which I didn't know about before watching the movie. It, it makes for raucous laughter. And we have connections to other movies when they bring up that God is a woman. I just think Jason Muse does his best when he's over the top. It's highlighted in my scene the best. I think in Clerks 2, you're mellowing him out as a time capsule, looking at it in a little window here for this moment. I don't think it works quite as well. The language is the same. The scenes are set up. Mine did it first, and I think it did it in a harder, faster, quick-hitting means for Jason Muse to be funny. My scene crawled so Nazarius could walk, but I say his walks with a limp because how it's set up, it doesn't make it as funny. I think it's about the language, how he expresses over the top, and that's done best in the fuck song Jane Silent Bob Strike Back. Time. Okay, uh, we're going to move over to Nazario. Nazario, you have one minute to close when you start talking. How can you point out that the funniest scene he has done ever is the scene where he does the one thing he's known for? He has done the joke about saying profanities for four movies before this movie, and they are going to start this movie just like, let's just have him say more fuck, and that's going to be hilarious. It's not. It's tired. It's, it's, it's something needed to change. And what did they do? They went with, you know, growth with the character he had an important moment he went to rehab he stopped smoking weed he became religious and it's hilarious like they found a way to grab the concept that was based for a character that would show up for two seconds in a movie say fuck and move on and be fun and supposed to be memorable and funny and make him a character that actually had some value and growth by the way you're the one who's mentioning other scenes from the movies. You're the one mentioning the, that he mentioned the connection to other movies by saying that Dodd was a female. And then you tell me that, yeah, growth doesn't matter because it's the sixth movie and mine did it first. Yours was the last time they used him that way because it was tired joke and it wasn't working. Mine is brilliant. Okay. You know what's not funny? Jason Mewes. <laughs> yeah. ha. I mean, come on, guys. All right, judges ready? See, si, senor. Okay, I'll go first. Uh, I haven't seen either of these movies. I don't give a fuck about these movies. Uh, I've seen only a couple Kevin Smith movies. I've seen Zack and Miri make a porno, which I do like a lot. I think that movie's really funny. Um, and I saw Tusk. I saw Tusk, and it made me want to fucking kill myself. Uh, that is one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my life. No. Dude, it is so bad. And the image of Justin Long as a fucking walrus gave me fucking nightmares for years. That movie is garbage. Anyway. Um, <laughs> And I, I don't think I've seen anything else that Kevin Smith has directed, frankly. I'm Do not to... watch Yoga Jersey Hosers. Girl? Don't watch Yoga Hosers. I've not seen Yoga Hosers. Jersey oh. Girl? No. Cop Out? No. It'll be something that eventually I'll get through, but I have not gotten there yet. Um. So that being said, what is the funniest moment in a Muse film? Listening to their pitches, I had nothing to go on. I needed to go off what they said, what sounded funny to me, um, and also just kind of the history of the character as they brought up. I went with Robert. Uh, Robert convinced me that his scene was pretty funny. And Nazario's pitch also, like, I thought sounded funny, but I was a little lost on what the actual, what, like, happened in the scene because it sounded like in the beginning of his pitch, he was like, they go to, re in the movie, they go to rehab and they do this and they do that. And I was like, and then they get money and they sell drugs while talking. And I was, I was confused about what was this like him across the whole movie or is this just one scene? Like I was very confused. Um, I frankly, I, cause I just had no idea. Um, 
And but Robert was very concisely like, he's a guy he shows up, sings a song, yells fuck a lot. That sounds funny to me. Uh, Nazario is going to be mad at me for a year now, but uh, hey, I voted for you on Robert's question, so haha. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Cody, you're going next. Uh, tell me why I'm dumb. Uh, yeah, Nazario is going to be pissed. Uh, I'm going to get like seven individual matches, messages that oh, is just God. one giant paragraph, but he breaks them apart because he hits enter. Um, about why this is, um. I think both of these, I, uh, my favorite thing about when somebody pitches the funniest moment and then they try to depict it as funny and I'm just left back here with a blank stare and be like, that was supposed to be funny. I didn't get the memo. Um, I believe Robert did a very smart move in this draft. I think he picked, he talked about other scenes, blah, blah, got Nazarian to talk about growth. I thought Nazario was going to, like, abandon that. I just think that doesn't add anything to the funny moment. Sure, he does things, and it's more an impactful scene, but I don't give a damn about that. It's supposed to be funny. So, fuck, fuck, fucking fuck Robert, I guess, because he says fuck a lot. I don't know. All right. Uh, Mark, uh, your vote doesn't count. Is this another clean sweep? He's probably seen both of these, too. <laughs> I mean, I have, but it's like, <laughs> I don't know, man. This one, was, this one was a little... Like, even though I have seen this one, I also had trouble, honestly, with both of them. Like, what exactly the scenes they were talking about were. I I, I think, you know, I just I just had to go with my gut, and I honestly did go with Nazario on this one, so not a clean sweep on that one. I, I just kind of went just because he... I feel like the, the scene he described was just kind of more creative other than, you know than saying fuck a whole bunch of times like that seems really repetitive sometimes that's funny all right um so that means we are moving on to the bonus round uh we are tied up two to two um so here is what have i ever never have i ever not gone to the bonus round i I feel like i do this every match title match uh rue Rue was saying Rue was saying the other day that, yeah, you should want, like, I mean, bonus rounds are, like, it means, like, it's a good match. But uh, Rue was saying uh, his match airs next week. Uh, but he was telling us before the match that, like, uh, every single match he's played except for one has gone to the bonus round. I was like, that sucks. Uh, but anyway, I randomized uh, between fandom and melee which uh, side would be drafted. Um, and then I randomized a category from the remaining categories that weren't drafted in the prep questions to find a category. Uh, then um, I get a question and I am going to say the question. Once I say the question, uh, I will repeat it once I've said it a second time. <laughs> then you guys can answer. You can use Google and your uh, any means to find an answer if you need to. Um, whoever says their answer first will be going first in the debate, um, and then whoever says it second will be going second. Obviously, you can use your time however you want. You have 45 seconds up top and then 30 seconds on the bottom. Any questions about how it's going to work? Yeah. Are you going to give us a category first? I will. But should... No, blind okay. fight. Yes, your question. No, uh, so... Uh, the side of uh, fan zone that was uh, drafted was uh, May zone, melee. Okay. Uh, you had no consideration for me when you changed the name. Uh, I'm gonna I- just switch it back next season. Fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> Cause chaos. So melee is the side that was uh, randomized. The category that was randomized was sci-fi fantasy. And the question is. What is the best non-fandom sci-fi movie of the 2010s? Hmm. So again, what is the best non-fandom sci-fi movie of the 2010s? You look like you just told Nazario, hey, give me all the receipts of everything you spent on the toys in the last year. Um, Arrival. Mad Max Fury Road. Okay. All right. Uh, so we're doing Arrival versus Mad Max Fury Road. Um, we are. I'm going to take out Mark and uh, Cody. I'm going to stay on screen for the whole fight. Robert uh, said his answer first, so he's going to be going first. 
Arrival versus Mad Max Fury Road for best non-fandom sci-fi movie of the 2010s. And Robert, you have 45 seconds when you start talking. I think when you think of best sci-fi films, it's not just about necessarily what uh, coordinates to an action film. I think it's about something that makes you think about where life can go forward, uh, especially if it's in the near future or the future. And I think Arrival does that in such an interesting, compelling way. Aliens come down. We have no way to communicate them. It takes in the idea that just because they're aliens in a movie, we can communicate with them. It takes that out. It's about teaching them a language. And it's a slow burn as we understand that the language is an ideal idea to try time travel. And we're doing it in a Dr. Manhattan way where we're looking at different timelines and they're uh, connected together and compacted at the same time. It's so compelling how we find out Amy Adams' history, past, present, and future, how that connects with Jeremy Renner and how it connects with how she can get together with the aliens. Okay. Nazario, 45 seconds. Mad Max Fury Road is a complete reinvention of a series 30 years after the previous sequel by the same director who shows he still has what it takes to make it. The movie is all about visuals and action. It, it takes embraces his dystopian future sci-fi scene and makes the most out of it. It doesn't. It just reinvents the wheel. It just takes his, his main character and puts him as a supporting character to a new character who's a female lead who empowers her and gives her the central role, who's uh, Furiosa. And they shows you so inventive ways to do it. You drive trucks into a thunderstorm in the middle of the desert. You have guys painting their face and just shooting fire out of it. You, it feels like nonsense, but it feels like controlled madness at the same time. And it never takes the feet off the gas. It makes everything that will work from this old series right. into new modern series. Time. New modern series. Strike from the record. Uh, Robert, 30 seconds. Yeah, I mean, there's there's basically no plot to Mad Max Fury Road. It's just straight action. And uh, my, my movie has a female lead that, I mean, that sort of cancels it out. It's, it's about how it creates a story and a dynamic and, and Mad Max Fury Road it's high intense and it's high octane but it doesn't do anything more than just set up for people to drive down the road to get to a place that they realize they can't get to and then they come back there's not a whole lot of uh, good storytelling within it it's just high octane action and I need more from my sci-fi movie Time. okay Nazario 30 seconds invents new ways to show this action in this sci-fi. It makes it interesting to the way that make the plot becomes secondary to the visuals that you are experiencing in this new adventure. If you boil any movie down into that simplicity, I can do the same to yours. It's about aliens that come down to Earth, they get a woman that knows languages to try to talk to them, they talk to her. That's the movie. If you if you boil things down to that point, then it may make no sense. Your movie is more of a drama than a sci-fi movie. The only reason that it's called sci-fi is because they're aliens instead of foreigners. But other than that, it's pretty basic drama film. Time. Okay. <laughs> I, I saw Mark go like this. I was like, oh boy. Oh man. <laughs> I love it. Oh. Fucking great. We need to do a minute and 45 seconds. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, yeah, we could have talked a bit more. Yeah, I that's, mean, that's uh, the whole point, though. I know, I know, I know. Be precise. I, so, if you guys are debate, can I talk while you guys are working it out? I don't want to step on your stuff. Um, no, okay. I'm trying to think. Though. Okay. Um, I've, is, I've been getting like notices in my YouTube channel about like watching old movie fights like from back in the day and they used to do like 20 seconds and 10 seconds on speed rounds. Oh. You could barely get a point out. I was like, why yeah. did they do it this way? They should have figured out a way to make it longer. Like you guys have done here. It's just ridiculous. Like you can't do anything in 10 seconds to rebut anything. Like, can, 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 can you imagine if we go five minutes with this? <sighs> that would be fun. <laughs> I, I debated Jacoby against Mad Max Fury Road in the last match I did. It was great. All right. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm probably going to make somebody mad. But... Well, I mean, we always make somebody mad. Uh, all right. We're going to go to Mark first on this one. Mm, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> man, I just. This one's, pretty, this, one, this one's really tough. It's probably the toughest one of the match so far. Like, uh, you both they made, they made some really good points, I think. It, it is kind of funny since um, at least uh, the arguments kind of boil down to ins essentially style or substance. And 
I think with this particular case, I was won over by the style and I went with Nazario. Okay. I'll go next. Um, two excellent picks. I, unlike some people here, uh, love both of these movies, uh, <laughs> which is why I was <laughs> laughing a little bit when Nazario picked Fury Road. Um, and I thought that both had this a very good back and forth. This is this is very close for me because I think that um, Robert's point about I, it, it's the tried and true criticism of Fury Road that it has no plot. Um, and I thought that Nazario's hit back about like you could boil down any movie to be like generic, whatever. Like, and he I thought he did it to Roberts pretty well. Um, I thought that Robert had a good hit about uh, Nazario spent a lot of time talking about like um, how Furiosa having a female lead was like a big thing for his movie, and uh, Robert was like, my, my, my movie also has a female lead. <laughs> so I thought that was a good hit back. Um, at the end of the day, what kind of <sighs> again, 4951 thought this was really mm -hmm. close. I, re I genuinely really did because. I went with Nazario. Um, I just thought that at the end, I thought that his last like ten seconds, I, I the 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 hit about like that I already mentioned about the um, boiling down the plot, I think did did work really well. And when he was talking about how he even admitted, he was like, "Yes, the plot is second to the visuals of Fury Road." but you're taking all the action and doing it in a brand new, like exciting way. And I thought that his recontextualization of arrival as if you just did it like with uh, foreigners instead of like aliens, like it would basically be this, like the same type of movie. Like I thought that was a really smart point at the end there. So very, very close, but I went with Nazario uh, Cody. Yeah, I don't believe this is hard overall. Um, I think one of these this was hard. No, this was hard. Oh, this okay. Um, but my opinion is one of these movies. I don't really love the ending of it, but overall, a good movie. The other is absolute horseshit on the screen. Um, but I have to not take that into account when voting, and it doesn't matter because the winner is already real. Uh, this says Nazario, but I'm really changing right now to Robert because I feel bad. Um, uh, and I don't like Nazario. Um, I just think there was just, I think the plot line I don't think matter personally to best overall because even though <laughs> I would say a film needs a plot, um doesn't mean in the question. So overall, I think it was, I think it was really close. You guys bad. And I almost went Robert because there was the entire point of the fight. Nazar said nothing about rival, like nothing. And I was like, if he says zero things or very little, I have to go, but it was very close. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, that means your winner is Nazario Montenegro. Uh, we are going to start post-match interviews. Starting talking to Robert. Robert, great match. Um, you got to feel pretty good about that Muse win uh, because you could tell that that got under Nazario's skin, which is always fun to do. Um, a very close, as close of a match as we could get, uh, really, with the uh, uh, split or the clean sweeps and then um, uh, going to the bonus round. Um, how are you feeling, man? Um, I'm on a bad trivia run lately, uh, so it's been kind of depressing for me. Um, and if you look at like votes, technically it was like five votes to ten overall, which is kind of gross um, for it being going to uh, the bonus rounds. Uh, so that stinks. Um, yeah, I mean, I to be frank, I did all this when I thought we were doing the original air date, so I. Uh, uh, hadn't looked at my notes and things in a while because I had other things to prep for, uh, along with caring for a child, which is its own thing. But, uh, yeah, I understand uh, the thought processes for the judges. I get it. Um, yeah, uh, it stinks. I wanted to try to get a little bit farther. I know what's happening next, so I wanted to try to play the person who's next. But, you know, 
you can only live and learn and grow. So I'm going to try to do that with this. That's fair. Robert, I think that's a good attitude to have. Um, you will be back next season. Um, early in the season, we're not doing another big, big tournament thing again. So we're going to get to see um, a lot more people play a lot more next season. I'm looking mm-hmm. forward to seeing you come back um, without spoiling. Well, I guess you, you were you if you would have won this, you would have played either Bill or Rue. Uh, mm-hmm. Do you, is there anybody else? Like You clearly want to play one of them. Uh, is there anybody else that's in the league that you just want to scream at? Maybe Nazario. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think if there's someone. Um, Maybe get retribution against somebody. No, I mean the retro, the retribution. Uh, I clearly got my butt kicked, except for in this one. Um, no, uh, I don't know. Coho, Coho, maybe. Great. Uh, I have to, I have to try to get up to him. I think, but that would, that would be fine. Um, I mean, you're not that far off from. He him, doesn't but... watch films. It works. I you, like to debate actually... people who are really you're, younger you're, than you're people. higher ranked than coho right now oh so, shit so oh, you no know, that's he he has a match coming up this season uh and if he wins that he'll actually be more up on your level so that yeah. is definitely something that um could happen i might i might i might make it happen robert uh really great game um we're gonna move over to nazario nazario uh two things one we tried to censor you and you listened to us um, but then you lost on a view askew question. So um, why why do you want to hurt? <laughs> uh, I wish sometimes. I know it's uh, it's not going to be a reality because I have asked this years before. If people pick something with enough ahead time and you haven't seen it, get a frame of reference. Like this is how I lose to Boatman on a horror movie about the Chucky franchise where he doesn't even know the character's name correctly because people believe his bullshit. Okay. Other than that, yeah, I'll, I'll admit that I basically had to rework the whole first question on the fly because I used like 10% of what I had set up. And probably that uh, didn't help me at all. Although, I, I mean, I tried to make it make sense, which is something. Uh, other than that, dude, like, I was going to say Arrival. That is the best movie of the sci-fi in the 2010s. But if there's something I have learned in this thing and in this kind of system with debates online, you never go first on the bonus round because okay. people will give you some shit that then you don't have the time to rebut without sounding desperate, like interpret interpreting the question differently. I, I do not like to play defense with no time on the clock. So I rather just list, hear them out and then figure out a way to go. Um, I mean, that's fair. Uh, I think that you could have, uh, you know, you could have picked uh, Blade Runner 2049, but that's fine. Uh, yeah, that's and, a good one. But I haven't rewatched it so recently. I, I couldn't remember specific things from it. The other one I thought of a lot was Inception, but I didn't know if that was. Oh, shit. Yeah, that's 2010. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Uh, so anyway, and Nazario, you're moving on uh, in this uh, title picture. You're going to play uh, next week's winner, uh, which is uh, going to be the winner of uh, Bill Cariola and Rue Moses. That sounds insane. I love it. I hope it's, I kind of hope it's Bill. Like, that would be nonsense. Like, straight up nonsense. It would be nonsense. Absolutely would be nonsense. Uh, Desario, I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Uh, congrats on the win. And let's get final thoughts today, starting uh, with Mark. Uh, yeah, you know, just a quick Google search on the sci-fi movies. They could also go on with, oh, wait, I was going to say Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, and, like, that's a fandom movie, you stupid asshole. But I was like, <laughs> <laughs> that was ridiculous. I, I, like, I almost made myself look like a nincompoop. But the match here was still pretty good. You know, I thought Robert came, Robert came in kind of how I thought he would. Uh, came in, came in with some hard, hard knocks and, like, a, you know, Sometimes that happens with, you know, with, with, with you know, the born, born question. You lose, the, you lose your question. That kind of sucks. But, you know, Nazario is just Nazario, and he usually finds a way to pull these ones out. Yeah. Cody, final thoughts from you? 
few things. Robert's a really great player. I like Robert. I think when I first joined this community, when Robert first joined, I don't know there was tension between us, but Robert's a really great guy. I hope he wins soon um, because he deserves a win. I think he played really well today. He could have swayed in any way, different ways. Um, Nazario, uh, no, we will not watch the movies prior for you asking. Uh, you're supposed to paint the picture and give it to us um, and defend it. Um, yeah, so that that's just that. And yeah, and judges suck because I'm one of them. You know, you just have to you have to convince us all to that we're you're right. So overall. It was a great debate. I think Nazario versus either one is going to be a fight. And I don't think that one I get to. I think I think round one is the only one I get yeah, to. You, yeah, you're done. You're done. done. So. so good luck, everybody. I'll see you at the end. <laughs> All right. Uh, guys, fantastic match. Thank you to Robert and Nazario. Thank you to Cody and Mark. Thank you to Brian and Kirk behind the scenes for helping write questions. I have been Tim. We'll see you guys next time with another great match. Until then, bye. Hey,